I'm talking today to Mark Amrod. Mark is a former Royal Marines commando. He's the UK's first triple amputee to survive the Afghanistan conflict uh, from the UK. He's also the Invictus Games athlete. Uh, he won medals in both the 2017 and 2018 games, uh, gold medals in 2018. He's a motivational speaker. He's the author of uh, Men Down. Uh, Mark is one of the most inspirational people I know, who I got the pleasure to meet personally as well. We met about five years ago in an event, and I think you, anyone listening in, you'll really love to hear what Mark has to say about mindset and his story. So, uh, Mark, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, mate. And it's, it's good to speak to you after so many years apart. Yes, last time I spoke to you was about four years, I think. Uh, yeah, at the Tony Robbins event. Yep, that was there. That was there. Um, I think a great starting point, maybe for people listening in who don't really know you, maybe for you would be to go a bit about your background and maybe just to uh, what happened with your life, which led to your accident, maybe in Afghanistan. Yeah, sure. Um, so as you said, you know, in the introduction, I'm a, I'm a former Royal Marines commando from the UK. And that's pretty much all I've known my entire life. You know, that, that where it all started for me was when I was about 15 and a half. And I was coming to the end of my compulsory education. I had my exams on the horizon. And I kind of knew that once that was over, I had to either go into further education and decide what I wanted to study or go out into the big bad world and get a career. So after a little bit of soul searching and you know asking teachers, friends and family for a bit of advice, I decided that once my exams were over, I was gonna join the military and in particular the, the Royal Marines. Again, after some research and, and seeing which each branch of the military specialized in, you know, I decided that I wanted to be a Royal Marines commander. So did the exams, actually did pretty well. Could have went on to university and, and carried on my education, but didn't really feel that was the natural path for me. Joined the Royal Marines when I was 17 years old. Finished my training when I was 18. And then set out with a big old smile on my face for what I thought was going to be a 22-year career of adventure and progression and, and personal growth and, you know, world experiences that I don't think I would have got anywhere else and that's that's how it started off you know very shortly after I finished my training at 19 I was deployed to Iraq in 2003 so I got given my first taste of war at a very very young age I came back and traveled the world training in places like Norway learning how to operate in the Arctic sailing to Virginia in America and operating in, in environments down there, you know, joint coalition forces. I boxed for the Marines for a little while as, as a heavyweight boxer um, and enjoyed my time doing that. And then in 2005, when my first daughter was born, I put in my notice to leave and decided that after having served five years, which is our minimum return of service, I was going to leave. It's still only be 21 years old, so I could start a new career and be around to support my family and enjoy watching my daughter grow up. So I put in my notice, we, we have to serve 12 months from the day we do that. Unfortunately, uh, part of the way through that process, I, I separated from my daughter's mother. And when I left the Marines in 2006, in January, I ended up going to South Africa and I retrained as a bodyguard. I did a six week course out there in Cape Town, came back, uh, started looking for work, took a job, in the meantime, as a nightclub doorman, that didn't work out too well for me. Um, no work was coming in the bodyguarding world. I, I just guess I was too young. I didn't know anybody. Or despite having done what was considered the, the second highest course in the world, in, in the coach protection industry, I still couldn't get any work. And so in a bit of a panic, I decided in 2007 that I was going to rejoin the Royal Marines and then pick up my career where I left off. And so that's what I did. Early 2007, I rejoined. Um, I was drafted to Taunton in the West Country, which is only about an hour and 20 minutes from where I live in Plymouth. And as soon as I joined the unit, I was involved in pre-deployment training to go to Afghanistan in September 2007. So we deployed. 
after all the training, uh, probably four or five months of training altogether, just going all over the UK, you know, doing all that, that necessary stuff. Hit the ground September 7th, 2007, spent three or four days in a place called Camp Bastion, just getting acclimatized to the weather and preparing all of the kit and equipment. And then I was flown out to the Helmand province where I can have a place called Ford Operating Base at Robinson. Now about three months into that tour of doing all the, the normal, basic, low level infantry style soldiering that everyone in, in that position does, we were given a, a brief on a foot patrol on Christmas Eve that year. And it, it, was, it, was, it was nothing out of the ordinary. You know, we'd been in Afghanistan for about three months at that point. We had been foot patrolling at least every other day. We'd been conducting missions. We'd had contact with the enemy. We'd been in firefights. We'd done all that, that kind of stuff, what you'd expect us to do. So this patrol we were given a brief on was, was nothing out of the ordinary. In fact, it was probably, no, it was. It was the easiest foot patrol that we've been on to this point because we, we weren't given a mission like go and disrupt this enemy position or there's weapons over here, go and confiscate them or destroy them. The whole idea was just to go for a little walk around the perimeter of, of our camp just to show the guys that were watching us that we were still out there doing stuff, even if we didn't have that much really to do. So it was really, really basic, very, very simple. Um, and that's what we did. You know, we left about 10 o'clock in the morning on Christmas Eve. We were in two sections with eight men in each section. We, we went out the rear entrance of our camp. One of those sections went north, one went south. And we, we basically just patrolled around the area. We weren't allowed to go any more than 300 meters from the perimeter wall of the camp. And then we were told that when we both met now, these two sections that left out the rear entrance of camp, we would then meet at the front entrance. We would like, you know, secure the location, go through our normal drills that we did whenever we were going back into camp and then finish up and then spend three or four days uh, trying to enjoy Christmas. You know, we still got mail out there and presents and, and little boxes of sweets and stuff. So uh, the helicopter was due in to drop all of our, our stuff off. So we were going to take some time you know, open those presents and those cards and try and enjoy Christmas. On the way back into camp, as we were finished, the section I was in were given cover for the other section so they could go in, they would then get behind the perimeter wall, they'd cover us, we'd go in, and then we'd all be you know, back in camp safe-ish and ready to finish up. When we were doing that, uh, on the way to give cover to this other section, I went to get into a fire position, which involved me getting down onto my belly. And as my knee touched the floor uh, right in front of me, I knelt on and detonated an improvised explosive device. Now the result of that, uh, ultimately, was that I lost both my legs above the knee and my right arm above the elbow. Now, I do remember the, the whole thing. Um, I was, I was what do you remember? Everything. Everything, actually? Mm. Yeah, and, and looking back on it, actually, I, I think I'm very lucky that I do because a lot of my friends who had similar things happen to them who were knocked unconscious from, from a blast, from an IED or something, later on in life, if they, if they haven't remembered the incident, they, they have flashbacks and, and they suffer with you know, sleeplessness and that kind of stuff. And I've been very lucky that I'm not affected by any of that. But the, the short version uh, of what happened was I went to get down on my belly and now on an improvised explosive device. If you can imagine the ground in Afghanistan is very sandy and dusty. So initially when this device exploded, there was this huge cloud of, of dust and sand created. So I was blinded temporarily. I, I thought we had been attacked so, you know, my adrenaline had spiked, the fight and flight response had kicked in. My initial instinct was find where the attack came from, neutralize it, make sure that all my team are okay and no one gets hurt or, or worse. And then we'll peel back, we'll get somewhere safer, you know, and we'll fight this attack off properly until it's, it's done and, and we're all back safe. Now, once the dust cloud had settled, you know, and, and you got to imagine, you know, things are racing up thousand miles an hour your adrenaline's gone through the roof 
and I'm looking around, now I can see things, trying to find the rest of my team. When in, in that mad moment of, of chaos, where I'm expecting more income and attack from the enemy, I kind of, I just look down to where, you know, my legs should have been and notice what had happened and then realized we haven't been attacked. You stood on a, on a bomb. And so immediately tried to figure out what I was going to do in that situation. Now we're trained as bizarre as it sounds. We're trained that in that situation, what you don't do is run in immediately to help your friend because you risk setting off other devices. If you're in a minefield, there's potentially more mines and IEDs around. You could set them off, kill yourself, or kill the casualty. So there are set procedures that are put in place. People are given responsibilities in the case you know that this happens, and you have to really put your emotions in check and just be a professional you know, and do what it is that you're trained to do. And that's what those guys did. It honestly, when you do this stuff in training, you mess it up a million times. But when it happens for real, everything just, I mean, these guys were unbelievable. You know, one guy got straight on the radio, called in what we call a CASIVAC, casualty evacuation. One guy started coordinating everyone that was left into a defensive position in case there was a small arms attack that followed up. The guy closest to me, his job is to take out a bayonet or something that you can prod the ground with go in a very slow, methodical manner, prodding the ground at about a 45 degree angle, feeling for other devices, and then marking a safe route to his left and to his right, so that when the medic comes, he can run straight in and get to me without the risk, like I said earlier, of setting off any other devices. And all these guys were just phenomenal. They did everything that they were supposed to do. No one got over emotional and ran in to help me. The medic got to me you know, in the, the fastest possible time he could. And then he set about doing his thing. So he, he jumped in uh, into this crater that I was in, which, you know, I've read the report that the American Special Forces guys we worked with had written. And I was in a 12 foot by 15 foot crater as a result of this explosion. So it was very difficult for the medic to, to do what he did. But he got in. He gave me pain relief with some morphine. He put tourniquets on both my legs and my arm. While he was working on my legs, he got me to do up the tourniquet on my arm because that's that's the thing they're trained to do to keep me responsive, to stop me giving up and just, you know, dying on him. He gave me something to do. I didn't do a very good job. I just kind of did it to appease him and, and let him know that I was still alive. Um, he then put me on a stretcher, but as he did, you know, I wasn't, and this is the weird thing, what a lot of people can't quite comprehend is that I wasn't in any pain to that point, just a lot of discomfort. You had no pain when it happened? No, no pain. pain. It's like, a, you should imagine the most intense pins and needles throbbing feeling that you've ever had in, in my three affected limbs. That's all it was. But when this- So how would you describe it? Uh... You know, you know when, like, if, imagine if you, like, sat on your hand and it went numb, you know, and then you count, like, it's like that, but intensified by a thousand, you know? It wasn't, it didn't hurt, like, you'd imagine it to, it was just really uncomfortable. But when this medic dragged me on the stretcher, I, I felt pain. And so I looked down to where the pain had came from, and it was coming out of my right leg. And so I looked down and there was like a, like a piece of red rope coming out of my leg, covered in sand and, and dirt and claret and stuff. And I followed it in the ground and it went into my boot. And, and so I, I looked down and I imagined that this rope was like a muscle or a tendon. And what had happened is he had dragged me and where my boot was, my, my foot was still in my boot. The rest of my legs, both of them from the knees down, were, were just gone. They were disintegrated. But the weight of this boot and foot and where he dragged me had caused this, this tendon to stretch. And so I had to pick up my own foot that was in my boot and then put it on my stomach while this guy put me on a stretcher and then got me out of this 12-foot uh, crater that we were in. Now, when he did that, he took me down to where a vehicle was waiting. 
and he put me in the vehicle. And you have to imagine the ground. Th these are not smooth tarmac roads. These are dirt tracks. They're very, very bumpy. Uh, that's very undulating terrain. So we get in and the guy driving, you know, nails the accelerator to get me back to the helicopter landing site to get me out of there. And I'm bouncing all over the back of this thing, getting thrown around and they're, they're trying to hold me in. And on the way up this hill to go back into our camp, uh, the guy was driving quite aggressively and he kind of steered one way and hit the accelerator, which caused the medic to fall out the back. Now, as he fell out the back, I fell out the back as well. Oh, man. Right. Luckily, the guy driving swung around. He put his arm out and he just grabbed for whatever he could grab to kind of hold me in. And he ended up grabbing the femur bone that was poking out my right leg. Now, quite luckily, looking back on it, he made the decision to leave the medic who had fallen out because remember the other section I said we went out with earlier with the, the other eight guys in it? They were at the bottom of that hill anyway, so he was safe. He was protected by eight armed men. He would never be in any danger. So he left him, holding me by my femur bone in the back of his vehicle, trying not to let me fall out, drove back into the camp, drove to the helicopter landing site, and the, the, the last memory I have is of the helicopter landing and the kind of sandstorm it creates from the propeller blades and then the tailgate dropping. And then I, I blacked out, which is where they later told me that I, I had died. I was declared clinically dead. Mm -hmm. What was going on um, in your head like at that time if when you were conscious? Uh... You know, it's a lot of weird stuff that you wouldn't expect. So my initial thought and, and emotion when I had stood on this device and I realized what I had done was anger because, you know, in the Royal Marines, you're very, very highly trained. And toe-to-toe -to -toe and in a firefight, you could stand your ground with just about anybody on the planet. Right, and you do all this training, and you get told that you know you're this elite soldier, and you know there's not many people in in the world that can mess with you. And I just thought, well, I've just been beaten by like a piece of metal in the ground. How stupid am I? I'm supposed to be highly trained, yet you know this IED's just taken me out. So I felt a lot of anger. Then I felt guilty because I immediately knew that I put the rest of my team in danger, and if we were followed up you know, like an AK-47 attack or anything by the enemy, people would have died. And I would have thought that was my fault. And then my daughter at the time was, was just under three years old. And, and I just thought, well, what happens if I survive this? And she's got the freak for that, you know, and if I've got to get her from school, is she going to get bullied? Is she going to get picked on? Will she want me to be her dad? Because, you know, immediately you think you're going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. I didn't know anything about anything. And, you know, loads of things are going through my head in a split second. And so I was like, you know, I, I didn't even care about myself, about my injuries. And I was just thinking about, you know, other people, thinking, what have I done here? I've let people down, you know, I've put them in danger. And um, I just felt like I'd failed. You know, I'd failed to be this elite soldier, what I'd been built up to be, because I'd been beaten by, you know, this stupid, inanimate lump of metal in the ground. You know, so it was, it was bizarre, but I never... Despite what I was looking at and the amount of blood and claret and, and fluid coming out of me, I, I never thought I was going to die because I knew the people around me and the men that I worked with were so good at what they did that they wouldn't let it happen. Even though I knew that they were, you know, we're trained not to run in and yet let your emotions take a hold of you, I knew that they were going to get me out. I, I just knew it. And despite everything, I, I remember feeling very calm and very relaxed. Really, it, like mm -hmm. I had a lot of emotions going on, but calm and relaxed, if you like, were my outward emotions. But chaos and guilt and anger were, were what were inside. But I just knew I was going to get out of it. I, I don't know why. You know, I'm not getting airy fairy or whatever. But I just kind of was relaxed, knowing that they were they were going to look after me and get me out. Were you trained uh, to get relaxed, like in the Marines? Do you think it was like a natural instinct you had, or it's something which is a collective group maybe they instilled in you no i don't think we, you can't train for that man. 
It's um, mm-hmm. it was just my natural instinct. I was just like, right, something really, really bad's happened here, but the people around me are really, really good. So let's. And you kind of have to break it down to one thing at a time. You can't. You can't. And this sounds so like cold and clinical the way you think, but it's like, right, we've got to handle one thing at a time. First, get me out of here. Second, get me to the medics. Third, get me to the hospital. You know, and you can't be just, you can't get overwhelmed by everything that's going on at the same time. But yeah, it just my, my natural go to emotion was just calm and relaxed. Interesting. And after the accident, how long? more or less it took you to kind of get back to yourself, maybe quote unquote regular life to start the rehab process, which you had to do afterwards. So I spent three days in a coma and then four days on intensive care when I got back home to the UK. I spent five weeks on the the high dependency ward in the hospital. And then I was transferred to Headley Court Rehabilitation Center outside London to start learning to walk again. So it was all very quick, you know, um, only a week in intensive care, only five weeks, you know, with round the clock nurse, uh, medical care, and then straight into rehab, you know, which I'm, I'm grateful for because I think sitting around in hospital too long, too much time to think, too much time to analyze everything would, would have been bad for me. I just so it was better to be less time in the hospital, actually. Yeah, I mean, I knew you know being grown up and thinking about it i had to heal but i was also keen just to crack on and and get out of there and and learn to walk again Mm -hmm. what was your mindset uh, after that like after you already got back from the hospital and you kind of had to deal with this new reality what was your approach what were you saying to yourself like how were you dealing with this uh... so i i think that when something like this happens to somebody When you wake up in a hospital and you're at the level of, you know, the the drugs and the pain relief is at a level where you can actually understand what's going on in the real world and and decipher between reality because everything just feels like a dream for the first week because you've got so much medication. But when you come down off of that, I think there's only two ways you can go. You either look at it, you know, objectively, and you deal with it and you figure out a plan and you move forward with that plan. Or you just crash and you say, why me? This is rubbish. I hate the world, you know, and you go the other way. And, and I was just very lucky. I think that when I woke up, I was kind of like, all right, cool. Right. No legs, one arm. What do we do from here? Because, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. They're not going to grow back. I'm only 24, you know, back in the time. So I need to figure out some sort of plan where I can live the next 70, 80 years of my life and, and be happy, you know? So, I, and that's what I did straight from the beginning, started developing a plan of, of what I was going to do in my life. And it was difficult because I didn't know this life. I didn't know anybody who was disabled, who was an amputee. I, I had no clue. Um, so it was a lot of research. And luckily, you know, we live in a day and age where you can jump online and Google just yeah, Google. It. Find out as much information as you want in a heartbeat, and so that's how I spent a lot of my time in hospital initially in the first. Googling um, this kind of topic, obviously. Trying to find people that had my injuries that were out doing things that in my mind I thought I'd be able to do, because I didn't know what I would, you know, I didn't know how advanced prosthetics were, whether I could swim with them, and run with them. And I had no idea, um, so I had to kind of research a lot of stuff and get some sort of realistic expectations of what it was I would be able to do. And so I did that. And the, the thing that really, I, I think that really helped me out was being a Royal Marine because I had so much pride in my job. There's so much, um, I don't think stigma is the right word, like around the, around Aaron and the Green Beret. There, there's so much hype around it because thousands of people every year don't make it. They don't achieve the grade. And it's, you know, some of the hardest training in the world. And I thought, well, just because I've lost three limbs, you know, I'm still a Royal Marine. I still represent the Royal Marines and and the standards and the ethos and the morals that they've instilled in me. And I think at that time, 
we were 347 years old. We, the, the Romans were formed in 1664. Okay. And I remember thinking there are thousands of men that have gone before me and worn this beret and wore this cap badge and done incredible things. I, I'm not going to be the one to let the team down by crying about this and whinging, you know, and, and just giving up. I'm going to still represent them at the highest level that was instilled into me into training and those thousands of men that went before me. And that was my motivation, you know, not letting the Royal Marines down. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And did you have any self-sabotaging voice in the head at the time? Um, and if yes, how do you take control of it? I know almost everyone has to some degree uh, this like, bad voice. I know I have it sometimes as well. Um, how do you take control of this voice and kind of let yourself to the mentality uh, which you had or have right now? One of the good things, I mean, that, that voice came a lot during my rehab when I was learning to walk again. Because it, it, I'm not going to lie, it, it was so destroying. You know, it pushed me beyond my limits, mentally, physically. And there were many, many days when I was just like, I can't do this. This is too hard. You know, I, I, no one can do this. It's, it's ridiculous. Maybe if I had one leg missing, it wouldn't be so difficult. But I've got both my legs and my dominant arm. How the hell am I supposed to do this? But, and this is something that we both learned from Tony Robbins when it comes to modeling. Yeah. I found a guy in America who had the same injuries that I had, who was doing the things that I wanted to be able to do, but didn't know if they were possible. So whenever that voice crept in and I thought I couldn't do it, I would go online and I would watch his videos and his YouTube and, his, and I'm like, well, this guy can do it. And he's, his injuries are very similar to mine. So that means I can do it. All I need to do, like you already know, is figure out his mindset, figure out the physical actions he took and model them and copy it. And then I'll be able to do what he's doing. And that's exactly what I did. You know, I struggled through rehab a little bit in the beginning. Um, what with some, you know, some great physios and all that kind of stuff. Was using his blogs and everything as motivation. And then eventually, on the 9th of June, 2009, went out to meet this guy and train with him. Um, and How was meeting him? Uh... Oh, that, that, that changed my life. Because you mm -hmm. imagine back in the day before I went out there, I, was, I wasn't the only triple amputee in the UK, but I was the first one from Afghanistan and the first one since the First World War, um, military. And anyone, I only met two others that came to visit me and they were both in wheelchairs. And they, you know, I'm, I'm not disrespecting them, but they weren't living the life that I wanted to live. I knew I could have an independent life using prosthetics. And so I knew I had to go out and meet this guy and learn from him. And that meeting changed my life, in fact. What is it now, May? So next month, on the 9th of June, it's 10 years since I've used a wheelchair. Wow. I don't own one. I don't, I don't have one in my position. That's why right now you see me, you know, you can't, I've just flipped the screen down. I'm sat on my, on my floor. You know, I get around by scooching around on my bum when I don't have a wheelchair and I'm not in my prosthetics. But yeah, it's 10 years now since meeting him and, and him helping me and guiding me and mentoring me. And the trip changed my life. I don't know where I'd be if I'd not gone out there that time and, and met him. Yeah, that's an important reminder about uh, modeling other people and getting mentors. Uh, it's really interesting that you had the mentor, which went through what you went. And this was a core thing for what you're saying would help you. Mm -hmm. um, listen, Mark, you have, I think, an inspiring amount of resilience, which I kind of see in you. And I think others are seeing as well. My... What, what makes me really curious if this uh, resilience which you have was built uh, in you before you'd done the rehab or it was after? Like, was it already instilled in you or it's something you developed uh, because you had to develop it after the accident? And if it was after, what, what helped you maybe build this inner resilience? Uh, There's a part of it from before the incident because, you know, I joined the Royal Marines when I was 17. So I was still a boy. And, you know, I was very lucky I didn't get injured in training and I, and I got through, there, there were 62 of us that started and only 16 of us made it through in, in one hit. And so at 17 years old, I, I was pushed through all that stuff and I, and I grew up very quickly and I realized mentally more than physically what I was capable of if I 
approach things in the right way. You know, no matter how hard things got, how cold I was, how wet I was, how tired I was, how sleep deprived or food deprived I was, they taught me that you can always just keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. So there was a little bit that was instilled in me before. But, and again, this, this is something that I think I learned from around the time that, that we met on Tony Robbins. It, it was the whole gratitude thing. You know, I sit here now talking to you at the other side of the world on a laptop. I have an app on my phone that I can control my prosthetic legs with. I have the most advanced prosthetic legs in the world upstairs now in, in my bedroom. I have all this stuff to be grateful for. Like I'd even, the, even being able to find this guy online, Cameron, just by Googling stuff. You think 30 years ago, if this had happened to me, I'd have no internet, I'd have garbage prosthetics, I'd have a horrible wheelchair, I would have been discharged from the military with nothing, I'd probably be living in some crummy little apartment somewhere, miserable, with no access to help, the, the amount of support I get is phenomenal, you know, and I just every single day sit there and think, I can't complain, I've got so much to be grateful for. If, if this was 30 years ago, I'd be a different man, but you just have to concentrate on all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. do, do you think Tony's trainings, I know you mentioned that's where we met in Tony Robbins' event, really helped you kind of reshape your mindset and approach uh, to life? And did it help you specifically kind of with the mindset with what uh, you have to deal with? Do you know what it did for me? When I, when I went in there to the very first event I went to, the UPW, I went in this room, and by the end of it, by the end of the first day, I, I already had that kind of mindset, but I didn't think anyone else did. And when I left, I was like, holy shit, there are loads of people that <laughs> do. You know what I mean? And that's why I jumped into that environment so much. And it, I kind of felt like I was holding back a little bit from embracing that mindset. But when I jumped into that environment, I was like, nope, open the floodgates, let's go. And I just embraced it more. And I met more and more cool people and learned more and stuff. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that he teaches was really helpful for me, you know, in, in my life. And um, I think it just helped me build on what I already had. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and do you have any habit which you help yourself get into gratitude or it's just more a daily approach which you go for? Like, for example, maybe you have a set of questions you do at specific times. Like, do you have anything like it or it's just uh, an overall sense of uh, appreciation which you try and live with all the time? I have a little eight minute voice note in my phone uh, called the hour of power, even though it's only eight minutes. Um, and that's just something I did a couple of years ago, what I listened to in the mornings, just saying, it's basically uh, what I'm grateful for and then affirmations, you know, about my life and, and who I am and what I want to be and, and what I already am. So that just helps me when things get chaotic, which they often do with work and family and dealing with my injuries and, and everything else, it just helps ground me, you know, and bring me back down and be like, okay, let's refocus, recalibrate and crack on. Got it. Um, as I'm catching you, you actually, I think you just broke a few bones in your hand. Uh, I think it happened around a week ago. Um, so how is it like, because you already don't have two legs, you don't have one arm, and one, right now one arm is kind of not functioning as it was. So uh, how is it different? Like, is it still a daily struggle? Uh, what's your mindset around this when this happened? I'm not going to lie, it's not easy. You know what I mean? I've now, the one good hand I've got, I've broken my hand in two places on the, the fifth metacarpal. It's snapped in two places. I'm in a splint for two months. So I've had to cancel a lot of the, the stuff that I've got coming to work because I, I drive myself everywhere. I do all this stuff myself. I travel a lot. So I've had to cancel all of that. I have, I don't think I've let anyone down, but I kind of feel like I have by having to cancel a lot of this stuff. But at the same time, all I've done is look at it from a different perspective. You know, I'm like, okay, what's good about my situation? The good thing is I can spend more time with my kids. You know, I'm not going away for weeks on end working, you know, for all, all the hours that God can send to provide from. I'm here more and, you know, we can bond more. I can catch up on all the stuff that I often neglect because I travel a lot and 
you know, you can't, I can't drive and type and email and go through to-do lists and that all at the same time as driving. So I'm just trying to use this time productively. And that, that's what is keeping my motivation up. I thought I'm just going to use it well. I'm going to read some books I wanted to read. I was listening to a, another podcast before we got online, just doing some things that I want to do, relaxing, letting my body heal, and then just figuring out the next step. I'm not getting angry or upset or bitter about it. I'm just figuring it all out. Mm -hmm. so, sounds very similar to your overall mindset. Just find um, the good things, what you can take from every situation, basically. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and I like to kind of try and spread that across my, my social media. So I'm, I'm, you know, with a lot of, a little bit more free time on my hands now, you know, I, I just jump on there more and kind of try and spread that message. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like, oh, look at me, I've got a broken hand, feel sorry for me. It's, you know, this is, this is my mindset and my approach to what's happened to me. Yeah, it sucks, but this is how we're going to make the most of it. How do you think other people um, should maybe t t take second approach? I think this approach is uh, amazing, but I, I don't know. I see around myself lots of people complaining, and uh, I think you would have much more to complain from, from anyone else, but you have this approach where you find the beautiful things and you tackle life fully. So what do you think other people maybe listening in can do to get to this uh, approach themselves more into their lives? Well, the first thing I'll say is that it's not easy. It takes time and it takes consistency. But I always say to a lot of people, you need to kind of look at your life holistically. So what, what I mean is, and people, I, I think a lot of people don't realize this, right? This is my opinion of how 90% of people spend their day when they wake up. So the alarm will go off. They'll hit the snooze button several times. They'll drag themselves out of bed because they're going to go to a job that they hate. They put the TV on while they're brushing their teeth and they have the news on. And whether they're consciously absorbing it or subconsciously absorbing it, there's too much negativity. You know, the stock market's crashed. There's a terrorist attack. You know, this person's done this bad thing. A bunch of children have been shot up in a school. You know, and this is at like six o'clock in the morning, as soon as they get out of their bed, you know, and maybe they haven't, if they've got children, they haven't prepared the night before, like the school uniform. So everything's chaotic with the kids running around and everyone's stressing out trying to get ready for school and stuff. And then they'll get in their car and they'll put the radio on and listen to the negative news again. And then they get stuck in a traffic jam and they're angry at the man that cut them up. And then by eight o'clock in the morning when they get into the office, they want to kill people. <laughs> and they do that like Monday to Friday and they're living for the weekend. And then on Sunday comes, they're depressed again because they've got to go through that five day cycle again. And it, it, I don't know, I, did, I guess it's just, I mean, I, I caught myself doing it a couple of years ago. And the first thing I did, as, as you know, I'm 35 years old. The first thing I did was start watching cartoons in the morning. I don't watch TV now at all. I, you know, like I said, I do the, the gratitude and I listen to a podcast or something. But I put on like Spider-Man with my son. And instantly my mood was lifted because I'm not getting felt fed all the negativity. So that really helped me get my day started off better by having a good morning routine. You know, it doesn't have to be anything too strict. Just notice the things that are, that are getting on your nerves and, and just change them a little bit, you know, because it changes your whole mood. And then gradually build on that. So then you, you bring in the whole gratitude thing. And, you know, what can you be grateful for? Social media is bad. You know, I'm on it a lot of the time. It's, it's good and it's bad. And, and I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm a victim of this myself. But you look at other people as well and you're like, damn, that guy's doing so good. I'm a loser. Why am I not as good as that guy? You know, look how well he's doing. And I, I do it all the time. And I know I shouldn't. And, and I have conversations with my 14-year-old daughter about this as well and tell her, stop looking at all these girls that are filtered and photoshopped and thinking that you're not as pretty as them because you are. You're prettier than them. And they're all, it's all fake. And that's a bad thing as well. You know, that affects people's mindset when they constantly compare themselves to other people and how they're living and what they're achieving and what they're doing. So I try to limit myself to that. And again, a couple of years ago, my, my timelines on my social media platforms, I purposely ditched anything that was negative and filled it with, with positive stuff. So on my Facebook, I'm still friends with people. but To I'm, spread the positivity. Yeah, but you can unfollow yeah. people. If they're just constantly moaning, you can be yeah. their friend but not see their updates. And you replace that with a more, you know, join a group that pumps out motivational quotes every morning. 
picture. So when you get on Facebook in the morning, you're looking at that and all you see is this positivity, you know, and people doing good stuff. And that really helped as well. So I think people need to, to take a look at their lives holistically at every little thing that they do, you mm-hmm. know, and, and make small little changes, you know, because it has a massive impact on, on your mental fitness. Mm-hmm. That's an amazing uh, tip. Um, I, I do want to touch a bit also Invictus Games. Um, could you share maybe with people listening in, uh, what is Invictus Games if you don't know it? So Invictus Games is, it's like a, this may come out wrong, it's like a watered down version of the Paralympics for military men and women all over the world. So it is a, it's a sporting competition that was started by Prince Harry and it takes wounded, injured and sick service men and women from the military all over the world and they compete in different sporting events. Now, a lot of people I found, you know, back when I first started rehab, I found a lot of my friends, when they were injured, immediately jumped into sport, whether they did it before or not. They, they just jumped into sport as part of their rehab. And I didn't do that. You know, my, my biggest goal was to be free of a wheelchair and all I concentrated on was walking and my, my fitness for walking and, and getting that done and then, you know, more children came along and, and I was discharged and I got a new job. So sport never came on my radar. But in 2016, I was sat down mapping out my goals for 2017. And I realized that Christmas Eve 2017 was my 10 year anniversary of being injured. So I thought throughout, throughout 2017, I'm going to do something that I haven't done before to celebrate 10 years of life. And so I thought about it for a little while and, and I racked my brain trying to figure out what to do. And then I thought, you know what? I haven't done sport. I've done no sport in 10 years of, of injury. So I'm going to try that. And I, I'd seen my friends doing the Invictus Games before. I knew a little bit about it. And these guys were winning medals and, you know, which is great. But what, what I really saw was how their lives were improving, you know, through the sport and how they were just, you know, I knew them from rehab and they were, at points very negative but when sport they just kind of smashed through that ceiling and just took their their whole life to another level so i thought i'll have a go at this and i knew nothing about it i'd never sat on a rowing machine before i'd never used a hand bike before i'd never done any of these things that are on offer and none of them really interested me because you know before i was injured i was a martial artist i did the boxing the kickboxing muay thai you know all those kind of things never did track and field or any of that kind of stuff I jumped in and I thought, you know, I'll have a go. And I picked some sports, which I I thought would really, I I thought they'd suit my skill set, which is brute force and ignorance. Just get something that you just go hard and fast for as long as you can and just outlast everyone else just through stubbornness. And so I picked rowing on an indoor rower first year, swimming uh, and hand cycling. And just started training and, and I very, very naively and arrogantly thought that I could just turn up, go like a lunatic and hammer everybody and win everything. And that was not the case at all. I was, I was an idiot. I, I turned up, <laughs> and got off a rowing machine after four minutes of going as, as fast as you could. And I went blind for like 15 seconds pushed myself that hard that I, I got tunnel vision, everything blacked out. But I was very aware that so many people were watching me, I had to pretend that I was cool and I was all right. So I was just like, yeah, I'm good. You know, just got off the machine and bum walked over to my legs to put my legs on. But I thought I, was, I, I just felt like I snapped something inside me. And I was like, I need to take this a bit more seriously. I need to train. I need to learn how these sports work. I need to start researching technique, strategies, and actually approach them with a, a plan rather than just brute force and ignorance. And it worked out all right. You know, we did all right in 2017, a little bit better in 2018. And for, for me now personally, you know, my Invictus Games journey as an athlete is over. Uh, I'm not going to do it anymore. You're not going to do it in 2019? No, um, for a couple of reasons. You know, first of all, I mean, last year over 500 people applied and there are only 72 places. You know, and I've been lucky enough to do two games and I, I don't want to take up a spot again if it means someone else won't get a go. I've experienced it. I've had a great time. My family have had a great time. I think I've had 
more than what I'm what I should have got from the games, and now I'd like someone else to have a go. You know, um, and on, on a personal level, I, I achieved everything that I wanted to achieve, and I think anything now for me would be a bit of an anticlimax unless I went out and did eleven events and got eleven gold medals. It, it would kind of be like an anticlimax for me. So. You know, I'm, I'm going to still stay involved, you know, and help and mentor and coach people as much as I can. But as an athlete, I'm, I'm pretty much done. I'm just grateful for the journey I have, you know, and where it took me. Got it. And what made you set this goal? I mean, you say you did it partially very naively, but it looks like a very big goal and something really um, impressive to do. So what made you really just set the goal and go for it? Because most people, like, don't set these goals and you would have more reasons and then others maybe not to set his goals, but you still did. So what made you set this goal? Just because I realized that this isn't just, I think this is human beings as a whole. I think the time that we're happiest is when we're making progress. But the only way we make progress is if we're outside of our comfort zone. And I've never done the sport before. Like I said, I had no idea what I was doing and was very uncomfortable you know, getting into that environment. But I thought, well, this is, this is what you need to do. If, if it makes you feel nervous and a little bit anxious and unconfident, it means it's going to be a good thing, you know? And, and that, and it, it wasn't easy, mate. It was hard, you know? It's hard to be like, oh, I can imagine it. Yeah. But I'm going to do it anyway. But I, I know that that's what you have to do. And what was your training regimen like uh, when you were training for the Victor's Games? Oh my God, it was brutal. So I, I, I work full time for the Royal Marines charity I have done since 2010. So I was working Monday to Friday. I was doing school runs, you know, doing the dad thing. I would train in my garage, you know, at quarter past five every morning. And then sometimes that would be like rowing, hand cycling on terrible trainers and stuff, you know, a static position. In the evenings, I would go and do strength and conditioning in the gym. And then on the weekends, we had to travel all over the country to attend sports specific training camps. So I, I, there was only one camp in two years that I competed that was in Plymouth where I'm from. The others were three, anything between three and nine hours away in a car that I had to drive to on a Friday, train Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then come back on a Sunday to go back to work on a Monday. It was, it was brutal. It was brutal. Um, but, you know, everyone has their own different reasons for doing the Invictus Games. You know, some people maybe with post-traumatic stress disorder just want to be able to be in an environment with loads of people screaming and cheering, and to them, that's, that's a win, you know? Some people want to just keep beating their personal bests, and for them, that's a win. But for me, um, and, and I, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it, for me, it was about medals. It wasn't about beating myself. It was about beating everyone else. It's, it's just a part of me that has, has been in me since I was a kid. Yeah, it's a good motivator as well. You know, to me, beating other people was beating myself. Because to beat them, I had to push myself harder than I've ever pushed myself. Harder than I can't make myself push myself to that limit just to beat myself. You know, when I look over to the left and I see a guy going harder than me, and I think he's going to beat me, then I've got to go to a place that is hard for me to go to on my own. So it kind of was about beating myself, but I wanted, you know, I wanted the medals. Did you know you were going to win before? Like, what was your mindset going into it? Uh... I had no idea what, because I'd not done sport before, I didn't know the routines, the procedures, the rules, any of it. And I kind of, sometimes I think that's a good thing because you don't overthink. If you know too much, I think you can overthink and worry and panic. Sometimes it's it's not a great thing. Um, and there were certain things that happened in 2017, which could have been avoided, which were avoided in 2018, which is why I had a better year. Had I known about how things worked before going in 2017, maybe things would have turned out differently, but you know, it is what it is. It's all part of the journey. You know, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm happy with how things went. Mm -hmm. Cool. And how is your training regimen today afterwards? Is it different? Do you still um, push yourself as heavily on a physical level? No, no, no. no. I, I am now all about health and wellness. You know, I've, oh. I've got one arm left. Well, at, at the minute, two fingers. Um, <laughs> and I want to look after that arm for as long as I can. So rather than 
training ridiculously and pushing myself to my breaking point every session, it's now just about keeping healthy, keeping fit, keeping mobile, keeping active and looking after myself. <laughs> you look more healthy and fit than most people, I think, from kind of seeing uh, your photos on social media. Uh, what uh, words of encouragement or maybe uh, things you would say to others who want to be fit but can maybe get there since uh, you are very fit from the side? Similar to what I said earlier, you have to look at your lifestyle holistically. So right now, I can't train. I've been told with this spin on two months, absolutely nothing. Not even a gentle, you know, go on my hand bike. I can't do a single thing. But I can stretch every morning. I can eat well every day, stay hydrated. I can rest every night and make sure that I get a good amount of sleep. And that, you know, just because I can't train, it doesn't mean that I'm not healthy and fit anymore. So, you know, people that say, you know, I can't do this, I can't, I can't get into the gym. You don't have to start with the gym. Just start with changing how you eat. Start with changing what you eat. Start with changing, you know, you know, I'm a, I, w- I watch Game of Thrones and all that stuff, but don't sit up to three o'clock in the morning watching Game of Thrones and have two hours sleep and then be tired the next day and then not want to go to the gym and then reach for the junk food because you're a little bit tired. You know, get your good amount of sleep, whatever it is you need, five, six, seven hours. Do that instead and just start at the bottom and build your way up. And then once you've got the basics cracked, then get in the gym. Then start learning about your body and how to train it. But there's so many things you can do. You know, I'll, I'll admit it now. I was gutted when they said, you can't train. But that I immediately sat in my car and I thought, okay, cool. I can still eat well. I can still stretch, look after my body. I can use this period of my life now for recovery. But all the training I've done, which is, you know, put strain on my body, now I can recover and chill out, you know, and get back to where I was. Mm-hmm. Uh, listen, Mark, do you have maybe three beliefs which uh, you can share with anyone listening, which you have, which you think helps you have um, big performance, which really help you uh, go and live life uh, fully, but you think maybe someone listening can potentially adopt to their lives? Yes. I believe that your brain will always quit way before your body will. Um, and, and that I think can apply if you're an athlete, if you're a businessman, whatever, you, you know, what we talked about earlier, the negative talk that creeps in, you know, I can't do it. My body's done. I'm, I'm done. I can't do any more. That will always happen at least 50% sooner than, than your body's ready to quit. You know? So I think, spending a lot of time developing your mindset, flooding it with, you know, podcasts, audio books, you know, regular books, just good information it is, a, is a huge game changer. I think, and again, we touched on this earlier, I, I believe that if anyone in the world can achieve something, if, if you're in a similar set of circumstances they are, like, you know, Cameron was a triple amputee, I'm a triple amputee. So when I, when I saw him, I thought, well, if he can achieve that, there's no reason that I can. You know, as long as I follow the same steps he followed. You want to be the next Richard Branson? Take, make the sacrifices he made, follow the steps he made. Dude, it's not that difficult. You know, if anyone can do it, you know, provided you, you're not born with a severe disability or something and you're at a big disadvantage, you know, we, we can achieve the things we want to achieve if someone's done it before us and, and proved, you know, and, and shown the way. And a third one, I guess it's kind of similar to, to the other two, but you know, I think we're all capable of a lot more than what we think. This goes back to what I said about the, the holistic lifestyle, and, you know, the news and negativity. I think we get conditioned and our default setting is negativity. You know, so you see a big challenge ahead and you think, I can't do that. That's like 90% of the planet's default setting is, is I can't, negative, you know, I'm not capable. Where actually we are, you know, you just need to flip that on its head and, and stick 90% of the stuff that goes in your brain to be motivational and, and inspiring and positive. You know, I, I can't stress enough the importance of that, of reading the right kind of books, listening to the right kind of audio, uh, watching the right kind of stuff on TV. I'm not saying you've got to be a, a complete monk you know, and sit outside all day meditating, reading, you know, the Dalai Lama or something, but 
just make those small changes, you know, in, in your car instead of listening to the news on the way to work, put on a podcast and that lifts you up or even some music, just some funky music that makes you remember some good times, you know, but we're all capable of a lot more than we believe we are. Thanks for sharing the beliefs. I really like it. Um, listen, Mark, I would love to throw away a few statements towards you. And I would love if maybe you can just finish the sentence with what comes to your mind, just a word or a sentence. Are you up for something like this? Do it. Sure. So what I know about myself after winning the Invictus Games is? What I know about myself after winning the Invictus Games is... I have grown up a lot through the experience. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I appreciate most is? The thing I appreciate most is, this is gonna sound corny, life. Because I lost it once and I was fortunate enough to get it back. And this is not some corny cliche, you know, Hollywood tearjerker movie statement, it is true. You know, I, I, I have died on the back of a helicopter and been brought back to life. And it gives you a different perspective on things. Um, what I now know about life is... <laughs> it's short and it can end in a heartbeat. But, <laughs> but, again, without getting too corny, it's beautiful. And it's what you make it. You know, we've got this big old planet out there and, you, you know, it's, it's a beautiful, you know, I'm talking to you, man. I was, every time I look on Facebook, you're in a different country. You're exploring. <laughs> like, you know it more than anybody. Yeah. But, you know, don't, don't get stuck in that, that miserable grind of living for the weekend. Just go out and, you know, we're not here for that long. Go out and live it, you know, and experience it and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, Mark, we're getting almost done with the time. Um, what you have for the interview, I think I have one last question for you. Um, what do you do now after you've won the Invictus Games? I mean, you overcame this, I think, tremendous challenge. You are an author, uh, you had a documentary, you train yourself to become a beast in performance. So, I mean, what's next for you? What's next for Mark uh, uh, in the next uh, five, 10 years? What's your mission now? So I am trying, um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to do this, what we're doing right here, but on the biggest scale I can. So I'm writing my second book now. And I've already in my head got a third book, which I want to write at the same time. I am trying to get my story turned into a movie. I've got a lot of stuff going on about that. I did the documentary last year. It's on uh, Amazon Prime. I'm trying to get a movie made. And it, it's not, you know, all this stuff, it's taken me a long time to be able to do this. Because in, in the military, you kind of, no matter what you achieve, you kind of just humble about it and you don't talk about it. So it took me a while to be like, do you know what I need to share this journey and this knowledge that I've picked up along the way with other people because it could help a lot of people. So I'm just trying to get out there more now in that sense. Um, so write more books, you know, do more social media, get out there and spread the good work. Mm -hmm. I like it. Um, Mark, where can people find you online or where would you want to send them um, for anyone listening in? So I am, I'm on all the usual uh, channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. I've just started a Patreon page um, to help support me with, with blogs and, and blogs that I'm doing. Uh, I'm on YouTube. I have a podcast, the No Limits podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean website markhomer.com pretty much anywhere mate if you just google uh, markhomer i'll pop up everywhere I'm like a, a bad smell uh, great i'll leave links to all of those in the show notes for anyone listening in including mark's uh, social media and anyone here i would recommend just follow uh, mark on social media he's uh, an amazing guy and i think he'll inspire you uh, a lot from uh, what he's doing every day um mark really thank you very much for taking the time and chatting with us today i appreciate it Thank you, man. It's good to speak to you after all this time. Likewise. Take care.